Okay. Uh, good morning, new wife. I'm trying to compose myself because the worship got me all messed up. Oh, <laughs> Jesus, that was such an amazing worship. Mm, good morning. As we go into offering today, we are here to offer ourselves. God, how can I talk about anything? We are offering ourselves. Thank you, Lord. Um, as I talk about the offering today, the scripture that he gave me is in Matthew 13 and 3. And in the storehouse, this is the book that our apostle wrote. It's called The Storehouse. And it's on page eight. And she talks about it when she talks about the parable of the sower. And on today, I just want to deal with one portion of that text. And it's Matthew 13 and 3. And it says, he told them many things in parables, saying, listen carefully. A sower went out to sow seed in his field. And I want to stop there and I want to deal with that. A sower went out to sow seed in his field. In this scripture, the person was known as a sower. What does it mean to be a sower? The definition of that word sower means a person who plants seeds. Sowing is not about the action. It's about the person. Are you a sower? Am I a sower? That should be who we are. It should be our character. It should be in our nature that we want to give back to the one that has first given us seed to sow. He cannot be a sower. We cannot be a sower unless we have something to sow. And we know the Lord has given that to us. They plant seeds because it's in their heart to do. That's what a sower does. They understand that when they give what they have, a harvest is soon to follow. Are you a sower? Are you giving and planting your seed into the good ground of new wine. Now I can't say into the church, I can't say into this place or that place, I can say into the good ground of new wine because I know that this ground, that this ministry, that it is good ground. I know that when I plant my seed here and I've seen it, I've experienced it, I know that God breathes on that seed because what's being done with it is for the upbuilding of the kingdom of God. So you've got to plant your seed in the right soil. No one tells the sower to plant or even when to plant. They do it continuously year after year because they know their obedience will produce a harvest. Are we sowers? Are we planting? Are we giving year after year knowing that what we give is producing a harvest? There's an expectation there. And not even a harvest just for us, but a harvest for everyone that receives and gets something from the seed that was sown. The harvest comes from God because of our obedience to be a sower. We want to have that sower's heart. We want to have that sower's mindset that it's a continuous thing that we do, not because we're told, because they're not told to sow. They do it because they know that's what's needed. There are three areas of our giving that make us sowers into the kingdom of God. And the Lord said to tell you these three areas. The first area is giving of tithe. And I'm going to break each one down. Giving of tithe is number one. Number two is giving of time. Number three is giving your talents. Tithe, time, and talents. That's good. With your tithe, you give 10% of whatever finances you receive, as it says in the Old Testament in Leviticus 27 and 30. The New Testament says they gave whatever they had and laid it at the apostles' feet. And that's what it says in Acts 4, 34 through 35. Okay. Number two, giving of your time. Every moment of every day devoted to doing what the Lord desires, giving your time to this ministry through your help and through your prayers, 
Listen, giving your time means praying for this ministry outside of Sunday. It means giving your time. If apostle says, I need somebody to come and help at the storehouse, give your time to that because that is also a portion of you sowing. You're sowing your time. The last one is give your talents. The natural skills and abilities the Lord has given to you, give them back to him. Yes. Because a sower is one that gives everything back to the one that has first given the seed to them to sow. Are we sowers? Are we giving back to God what he gave to us? He's placed it in us. If we haven't been doing these things, let's start today. Let's do it now. Let's become sowers in every sense of that word with our tithe, with our time, and with our talents. Mm. Father, I ask that you bless what they are going to give today. Father, we won't just give money or give what we think is just the seed of finances, God. We'll give to you in every area. We'll give you that tithe because it's yours already. We'll give you our time because it's yours already. We'll give you our talents, those skills, those abilities that you've given to us because they're yours already. We'll give it all back to you. God, I ask that you bless. I ask that you overwhelm them. I ask that you overtake them. I ask that you produce a harvest because that's what the sower expects when they give their seed, when they plant their seed. They're expecting a harvest. And it happens year after year. It's a continual blessing because of their obedience. So God, I ask that you bless our obedience. I ask, Father God, that it will be pressed down, shaken together, running over with good measure. Mm. We will receive that harvest because we've given in every area to the kingdom of God. I thank you, God, that we are sowers, not just by action, but through our hearts. We are sowers because we give our everything to you. I give you praise for this now in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 I don't know about you, but I got beat up in the offering, the pre-worship, the worship. Oh, God. Um, We're going to go into the sermon. Uh, I want you to be patient with me. Uh, It took me a little development on it. There's a lot of history on it, and it is, the title is Unusual Weapons. I want to give you some history. It's in reference to JL, um, and so I just want to give the history so you have that. I need to find the verses where this is at, because when I printed it, it left. I have that issue every time. Um, I'm going to go into the word right away. I, I got to find it because when you print for some reason, all my Bible verses leave. I don't know what that glitch is, but I rebuke that in the name of Jesus. So let me find it. Actually, I'm just going to read it. You, The first verse is, it says she answered, and it has to do with Barack and Deborah, the first ones of, of someone who can find them. The first one says she answered, all right, I will go with you. This has to do with Deborah. I will go with you, but you won't get any credit for the victory because the Lord will hand Sisera over to the woman. So Deborah set off for Kadesh with Barak. And whoever finds it, if you just put it in the chat, we'll just go from there and everybody can see the Bible verses. So we start off here with unusual weapons. And and I just want to give you backdrop to it. The Lord will hand Sisera over to a woman was the original prophetic word. When we look at a prophetic word, the reality of that word is not always met in the manner or the way we think it should be or it will be, right? Because we all talk about Deborah like she's the one that Sisera was handed to. And and when we look at Sisera, Sisera was the leader of of the actual group, you know, of the of the with the enemy and, and the people who were coming against. Um, the people of God at that time. And it was for about 20 years that they were coming against them. So this one prophetic word was real strategic and real specific, says the Lord will hand Sisera over to a woman, one woman. 
So I just wanted to clear that out. We celebrate Deborah and we celebrate her win over the battle, but we don't look at the war itself. The war itself was not won because at, you look at the leader of the war of the battle of the enemy was still not destroyed. So many times we think we have won the war, but in reality, we won the battle. And so we have to go to the head. We have to cut things out in the head. And that goes into our personal lives as well. But I want to really have us understand. Do you have this one? This is in Judges. It's in Judges 4, four 17. 17 through 21, just so you have that. Um, and then it says in the word, it says, Sisera ran away to the tent of Jael. Like how specific was it that Sisera runs away from the battle that's being fought and he runs right into the tent of JL. So he was handed, he was thinking he was escaping out of the battle and literally was walking into his death. He was handed over to one woman. And so it's just really interesting. He was handed over to her. The, the Bible says the wife of Hebner, it was the Kenite, because King, um, you can read the rest, was at peace with Hebner's family. So there was an, they were supposed to be allies, just so you can understand that. Um, she said to him, come in, sir, come into my tent. Don't be afraid. And she probably didn't say it in that way, like, don't be afraid. You know, like she was sneaky. She probably was genuine with him. <laughs> it's like, don't be afraid, my pretty. No, it wasn't like that. It was like, don't be afraid. Come in here, sir. So he went in and she hid him behind a curtain. So the first action she did was hide him, right? And he said, he said to her, please give me some um, drink of water. I am thirsty. So she opened a leather bag of milk. He asked for water and she gave him milk. And it says she gave him a drink and, and hid him again. And then he told her, stand at the door of the tent. And if anyone comes and asks you if someone is here, say no. Cicero was so tired <laughs> that he fell sound asleep. Then JL took a hammer and a tent peg and went up to him quietly and killed him by driving the peg through the side of his head and into the ground. Are you serious? Do you hear this story? It sounds so like I'm reading it like it's a, you know, a fairy tale or something that you go to sleep to, but it's really not. This is a really gruesome death. And so the whole army was being killed by by the Deborah and their their battle, the the people that they came against, right? They're be they're having a war at, or a battle, and they win that battle. But Sisera decides to flee, and in that fleeing, he flees to his own death. You know, just that's the reality. He flees and flees to his own death. So he wasn't killed. And I, I want us to, to understand that, that Deborah had the victory over the with Barak over the army. But sometimes it takes a specific person to get to the leader, an assigned person by the Lord. So now we're going into some more stuff, an assigned person. And that assigned person was JL. It wasn't Deborah, it was JL. So I want us to understand the least people that you would expect would be the person that God has assigned, right? The foolish things of God. That, that's me, the foolish things of God, right? That, I don't know about you, but that's me. And it's the, the foolish things of God is who he chose to, to drive a tent peg through the head of someone into the ground. I mean, that is gruesome. So battles, uh, battles don't destroy the leaders of the war. Only when the leader of the war is killed is a battle truly, truly won. So I want us to understand that. Look at Sisera and even look at Goliath. They were both like two, if you could say bad leaders, but leaders in authority in, in their areas, right? Goliath was like awful. Um, Sisera was awful. It's, these people were false. They were evil, but they could not be uh, overpowered by anyone but God. And then if you look at the two people that were assigned little boy David with a dang slingshot and the JL, you know, we're thinking it's a tent peg, but we're going to go further into this, right? Who was Sisera? Sisera was the commander of the Canaanite army and of King Jabin of Hazar. He was mentioned in Judges 4 through 5, if you need more uh, biblical reference. Sisera had 900 iron chariots at his disposal. 
I want you to have real history compared to the Israelites who had no chariots. So he had an overpowering army that should have been able to take everybody out. For 20 years, Sisera, he cruelly oppressed the Israelites. It wasn't one minute. It wasn't 40 days like um, Goliath. It was 20 years of oppression and cruelty. These people suffered. And, and Goliath, you know, he, he killed and, and oppressed a, a people as well. And so what I'm thinking today in reference to the unusual weapons, unusual weapons can be people. Unusual weapons can be the things around you. Your unusual weapons can be the things that you think is just your normal way of living. And it is a weapon that can be used or it can be used and weaponized for the Lord. So I know that we're getting a little history, but now we're going into to some of the word here. Cicero was delivered right to Jael's front door. And if you think about the prophetic word at the start, it was like, Cicero will be delivered to a woman. Like, it was like the Lord literally UPSed Cicero from the battle right to the tent, you know, right to her, delivered like an actual delivery package. Here is this person that I'd like you to kill so he never hurts anybody else. I mean, it, it's the mindset of delivery. If you think about in a delivery package, think about it. The prophetic word was already stated. And I'm just giving you history and backdrop and then delivery. He escaped. Or did he? <laughs> you know, he escaped. The word talks about like that he fled. But really, was he being led or did he flee? Just things to, to spark your, your mind. I want us to, in our process of learning how to battle, let's aim for the stronghold and a strong man, not just the demons or the armies. Because many times we, we go for the people around the leader, but we never go to the heart of the problem. It's like when we're casting out, we cast out the signs, symptoms, and manifestations, but we never cast out the demon. So we cast out, you know, um, a phobia, but we don't cast out the spirit of fear. So what I'm trying to get you to understand is to go deeper into the understanding of the word and what he's giving us here. We have to go to the root of the problem. We have to go to the head of the problem. We have to go to the stronghold. We have to go to the strong man of the cities and the states and the family. And what is it that's happening and generational curses? We can't just say, oh, I have diabetes. My grandmother had diabetes. My dog had diabetes. My sister had diabetes, but nobody understands that that's a generational curse that needs to be severed. I mean, I'm not trying to come against what just happened with this submarine that, that everybody drowned, but you had a direct relative from the Titanic. You got on this submarine and you decide to go see the Titanic and you die at the scene. Nobody saw the generational curse. JFK, all these presidents, all these people that have died in major accidents, generational curse. What is the root? We need to go to the roots of these problems. And so cutting off, killing off the whole entire, all the soldiers, but not killing off the head leaves us with a problem. And the Lord literally delivered that problem, literally delivered that problem. He did not flee. He was led to his death. So just wanted to give you some in, intel there. JL in the Bible was the wife of Hebner. We know this. And somehow... They were a, a peaceful people. They were allies with, with this, with um, Sisera and the king and all. So it was expected that she, he was really supposed to go in there and be able to rest. But looking at the word, it shows that Heber, Heber actually took his wife and his family and separated himself. You can look up the history on it. They separated themselves. What does the Bible say when we're separated? When we're separated is we become holy. So there was something that impulsed him, God, in his life to separate himself from everything. So they were separated, but in, in the world itself, they were considered allies. More, thing, more things to think about. Why did he separate himself? When we look at his name, his name means togetherness and partner. Mm -hmm. JL's name means he shall ascend or go up. So they had purpose, even in their names, they had purpose in their lives. The moment that they were born, they were ready, what? Separated by God. So just 
just trying to get you to, to go thinking. So you get to the, the part where JL kills him, you right? And then I hear the song. There's a song that Barack and Deborah sing. Are you ready for this song? Most blessed of women, BJL, the wife of Haber, the Kenite. Most blessed of tent dwelling women. He asked for water and she gave him milk. In a bowl fit for nobles, she gave him curded milk. She didn't just give him milk, guys. That was the weapon. The unusual weapon is not the tent peg. We have focused in on a tent peg. That's what finished him. It's like a mortal combat. Finish him. That's really what the, the tent peg did. It took him to his final death, but it was the curded milk. He was tired. He was exhausted. And what do we do? We give babies warm milk. We give people warm milk and it gets you sleepy, right? You get you get tired and, and you drink milk and you go to sleep. And she gave him curded milk. So he had some type of like a yogurt. So that thing sedated him. And then it says her hand reached for the ten peg, her right hand for the workman's hammer. She struck Sisera. She crushed his head. She shattered and pierced his temple. At her feet, he sank. This is a gruesome song, man. This is like a rated R song. He fell there. And he lay at her feet. He sank. He fell where he sank there. He fell dead. That's the song. The end. If you want a chorus, I don't know what the chorus would be to this song. But it's intense. <laughs> it's like, yay, let's worship to that next week. <laughs> but curded milk, it becomes a solid. So I want you to understand that curded milk comes, it, it clumps. If you take um, milk and you add a little bit of, of vinegar to it, it'll curd. Or if you add lemon to it, it'll curd. So it gets lumpy. And it's just a process of understanding that what she did was strategic. She looked around in her little tent. She's a tent dweller. That was her job. She was a tent dweller. So she was a tent dweller, but she could have had other abilities. But when you look around your room, when you look around yourself, you think you're small. You think you're small. You think you're nothing. You think that, okay, well, I'm just a tent dweller. I'm just a person of the tent. This is what I do. I'm just a wife. I'm just, you know, um, a person who puts tents together. The reason I want you to understand is to look around your surroundings and see what is a weapon. What is a weapon? What, what could be a weapon here? If you're a baker, you know, a rolling pin, you know, like at that point, a rolling pin. But I'm just trying to, to think of the different things, you know, so I had to knock somebody out with a rolling pin because God says so, you're going out. It's as simple as that. But I, I want us to understand that the woman did get the victory. She did. She got the victory. But there's four key points to this. I've given you some history. There's four points that you may want to take notes on. JL had an opportunity. They says she saw her opportunity to act and she seized on it. And that's again, Judges 4, 21 through 22. But JL, the wife of Heber, took a tent and took the, took the tent peg and took a hammer in her hand. She just took it. What's your opportunity? What's your opportunity you don't take? Number one, act on the opportunities that God puts in front of you. JL's action didn't make sense in the moment. To take refuge in her tent, show him hospitality, make him feel safe, and then kill him was a gruesome act of treachery. It was, it, she literally betrayed her country and family and everything she knew, but she never betrayed God. God gave her an opportunity to listen to him. We don't know if JL originally intended to kill Sisera. She may have been trying to delay him so that someone else could have killed him. When she didn't see anyone chasing after him, maybe the decision was made because God said, kill him now. This is the opportunity, right? An opportunity. We're talking about opportunities. What is it important? What is important is that when the time came to make the decision, she didn't hesitate. When God gives you an opportunity and he gives you instructions, do you hesitate? Soon Sisera would be awake and she took the opportunity to do what God was asking her to do. She didn't ignore. She had to ignore all fear. Think about it. 
what if he wakes up and sees what I'm about to do? What if he takes a sword to me? I mean, what's a sword to a to curded milk? What's a sword to a ten peg? What is a sword to that? You know, like the comparison, you try to really look at it. She was not prepared for battle. It was not even her calling and purpose to, to enter into a war. But she wound up finishing that war. She finished that war. She put that thing out. She went for the straw man. She, that God provided someone who was seemingly unprepared, not supposed to be the person in charge, she had no real weapons of warfare, like, right, our weapons of warfare are not carnal, they're spiritual, but she was not the person who should have done it, but she was the person who was prophesied to do it. So I want us to think that when the Holy Spirit prompts you to act, we don't usually have long to think. You don't have two hours to think. If the Holy Spirit told you, you know, go out and grab your kid from the street, you're not going to wait, right? Because that's your kid. But if the Holy Spirit tells you to go do something that you would never do, like drive a tent peg through somebody's head, he's not going to give you, you know, two years to make that decision. You literally have seconds to be obedient to God. And the moment you delay, you know, I've learned this from previous apostle, the moment you delay more than like seven seconds, you listen to the voice of doubt six or seven seconds. If you don't do what God says immediately as he's prompting, you're going to listen to the second voice. It's the voice of doubt. So that opportunity that God gave you to be obedient, you decided to be disobedient. We don't have time. We don't have time to think when he says, do this. Situations are ever changing in this life and opportunities pass by quickly. That is why we need to decide in our hearts that when the time comes, we're going to say yes to God. At that moment, we're not going to say no. We're going to say yes. Number two, use the tools you have been given. JL, under the circumstances, had no better weapon than curded milk and a tent peg. <laughs> curded milk and a tent peg since the tent peg was staying in a woman's tent there was no weapons nearby right there was no weapons not only she likely had extensive experience putting up tents because when you're a tent dweller you also have to be able to put them together so she knew the ins and outs of her craft she knew the ins and out of the dwelling she had. She knew every crevice of the tent she was dwelling. Do you know your house? Do you know every single corner of your house and everything that's in it? Do you know what can be a weapon? And do you know what shouldn't be a weapon? Just things to think about. She was so skilled with her with her, the tent peg. She used the resources given to her in this situation by God. She didn't waste a moment to think. If I only had a sword, I can kill him. If I only had a whip, I could hurt him. She simply took up the tools at hand and did what was being asked of her. Just like you think about David, right? A slingshot. I never, never get over that story ever. Slingshot. People got swords, people got bombs, people got arrows, and a slingshot is what killed this man. Because it was a slingshot with God. Curded milk and a tent peg with God is powerful. Just God equips his people for the works he puts in front of them. He gives us certain skills. And I want you not to minimize what you do because someone else does something different. And it may look like great. It may look, oh, okay, Deborah and the armies, and Deborah's a judge, and Deborah is a mother, and Deborah is a prophet. And I respect Deborah because I really do, I love that story. But the reality is, JL was what? The wife, the wife of Heber, and she was just a tent dweller, a tent dweller who wound up killing the stronghold of a whole entire army. Just want you to think, that's all. You can think with the Holy Spirit later. So he gives you certain skills and abilities and gifts for a reason. Take every skill, take every ability. If you bake, if you cook, if you sing, if you paint, if, if you run, whatever it is that you do, 
every talent, every ability, everything that you even like things that you're good at with your hands and surrender it all to God. Will he weaponize every talent and ability you have? Good. Even when we don't feel skilled or equipped or prepared, he ensures that we are for the sake of his glory. It may not look the way you expect it. It can take a lot of trust to act when we don't feel well equipped or even smart enough, but our God is sovereign and he, we can trust everything to him and he will make us competent. And if you're not capable, he'll make you capable. If you think you're not smart enough, he knows everything. Just go to him. It's not about you looking great. It's about him looking great. So I just want you to read, um, sec- we're going to read second of Corinthians three, five, and six. Note that um, it says, what is it here? I'll read it. Not that we are competent in ourselves to claim anything for ourselves, but our competence comes from God. He has made us competent as ministers of a new covenant, not of the letter, but of the spirit. For the letter kills, but the spirit gives life. He makes you competent. If you have no education, he makes you competent. He knows all things. He's the creator of everything and he knows all things. He makes you competent. You can be the most uneducated person and still be the smartest person in the room because you're the most revealed. Because if you're before God, you're going to be revealed and scholars will look stupid in front of you because the Holy Spirit knows all things and will guide you to all truths. So I just want to just say that. Number three, Some things are more important than following the rules. Do you hear me? Some things are more important than following the rules. Cicero's murder was a major act of treachery. She should have been murdered by her own kingdom. She should have been taken down and murdered and and sentenced to death. It went against everything she knew about even hospitality as a wife, as a tent dweller. She was supposed to bring him in, take care of him, not bring him in and kill him. Something hugely important to her culture was that she took care of people that came in. That was part of their culture and their nature. And then when God said, do this, she still said yes. We only need to skip ahead to understand. And, and look at Jesus's life, that rules are not always the way we need to do it. David went in to the temple, they were hungry and they ate the bread and it was unlawful to do so. Sometimes the things we do are going to be unlawful, but it's going to be right before God. Laws and what God says don't always equate to right. What God says is always right, but what man says in laws, they, they don't jive. They're not, they're not equal. So if the world says sin, this type of sin is okay, but the word says it's not, the word will always trump the law. Do you hear me? The word will always trump the law. The word is truth. The laws are not always truth. They're just facts. They're just rules. And it's not what I'm saying is go break every law. If it's speeding limit says 75, y'all don't need to go at 90, every single one of y'all. But if you do, that's between you and God and your ticket money that apparently you have. But what I, I personally don't have ticket money and I also have patience. <laughs> so <laughs> I have a little bit of both, but there's some laws that are worth breaking. I won't waver in my belief for anyone or anything. What does God say? Jesus denounced religious rulers for heaping impossible burdens on the people. He touched a leopard, even though the rules of his day said that doing so would make him unclean. And that's in Matthew 8, 3. He healed on the Sabbath, even though no work was supposed to be done. Mark 3, 1 through 6. So are you going to let somebody sick because it's not the day that you're supposed to do it? Some rules are meant to be broken. That's what I'm trying to understand, get you to understand number three. Number four. Number four is our highest motive 
should always be honoring and obeying God in everything we do, in everything you do, in everything I do. JL did not kill Sisera out of personal anger or revenge because they were an ally. She wasn't mad at him. She didn't say, this is my time to kill my enemy. He wouldn't have gone into her tent if he if they thought they were enemies, right? But it was literally God who told her to kill him. And the fact is, the Bible tells us JL's people, they were at peace with the Canaanites. That means if anything, JL should have been an ally. And I keep saying that because I want you to understand that. While the Bible doesn't express to us that JL's motive for killing Sisera, she might have had motive that was more important to her than earthly alliance. And what's that motive? The Lord. Her motive is the Lord. Her motive was the Lord. Is your motive in everything you do the Lord? Is he your driving force in, in every decision that you make in your life? Whether you go to college, whether you sit at home, whether you're a mom, whether you're a father, whether you're, you're going to do this or you're going to travel, whatever it is, is your motive God? Is he your driving force? Is he everything? The Bible tells us in 1 Corinthians 10 31, whether you eat or drink or whatever you do, do it all for the glory of God. Do you do everything for the glory of God? Do you eat for the glory of God? Do we? Tell the truth. Do we eat for the glory of God? Do you drink for the glory of God? Do you wake up for the glory of God? Do you go to sleep for the glory of God? Do you go to work for the glory of God? Do you put on your clothes for the glory of God? The point is I'm trying to get you to understand that do everything for the glory of God. And when you live like that, you may do some things that, that to the world may be treacherous, but to God is honorable. Who? What killed Sisera? What was around her? I'm just going to ask you some questions just to end. When she looked around the tent, what are the unusual weapons in your life? There was a prophetic word. She trusted his ally. He drank some curded milk and there was a tent peg. The word tells us that the weapons of our warfare are spiritual. But these two weapons were unsuspecting and unusual. If you kill everyone but the leader, you didn't win. You have to kill it at its head. She said, let me take care of you. Come in here. And she did what God told her to do. A tent peg looks like blunt force trauma. A curded milk looks like no threat. A woman looks like no threat. David looked like no threat as a little boy. A slingshot doesn't look like a threat. We don't look like threats. We're not supposed to look like threats, but we are a threat. You are a threat. You are an unusual weapon and you have unusual weapons all around you. And God is calling us into a place of using our talents. Even when you spoke about it in offerings, it's so funny. It was amazing because it's like using every talent and ability. JL used everything she had and it wasn't much. Deborah had so many things at her disposal and she didn't get the leader. She didn't get the leader. She prophesied that he would be delivered to a woman we don't know if she thought that he was going to be delivered to her because it doesn't say that. It doesn't specify that in a word. It just says that he would be delivered to a woman. Did she think he was going to wind up being taken to her? We don't know. There's nothing in the word that indicates that. But it could have been that she thought, oh, we're going to take this battle. The victory is the woman's. But this victory is now attributed to JL. And so I want us to learn I know this was a different type of sermon and, and teaching, but I want us to learn how to look at our lives and not minimize your life compared to mine or, or minimize someone else's. You don't know. Yesterday, I sat with a 16-year-old girl and that ministered to me because I talked to her and I, you know, I just wanted to hear her heart. 
And, and I posted it on my Facebook, but I just wanted to share it because it just really ministered to me. When I prayed for my children, I said, God, if they just want to be mother, a mother or, or father, I didn't know if I was going to have a boy or girl at any time. Um, but if I have a daughter and she just wants to be a mother. And this little girl looked at me and she said, my dream job is to be a mother. And it gave me hope. It gave me hope because like we look at the teens and we look at the young people in this world and we see how they're suffering. And, and, you know, in, in another time, I would have minimized that. I would be like, do you want to be just a mother? I'm like, shut up. Nobody wants to do that. That's hard work, <laughs> but it's honorable. She said, I just, my dream job is to be a mother. There's hope. There's hope, and I won't minimize that. Is that a JL? Is she a JL? <laughs> Is she a tent, you know, dweller? Is she a person that's going to murder a, a evil leader right in her tent peg? And we minimize it because it doesn't look like she's not a doctor. She's not an apostle. She's not this. She's not that. Who cares? If she winds up killing the leader that has cruelly abused and oppressed of people for 20 years. So in you're looking at other people and looking at your life, I want you to not minimize who you are and not minimize anyone else. Because you don't know if you will win the battle, but they will win the war. So Father, we thank you for this word. I know there was a lot of history. There was a lot of story in it. But I ask you that we receive the revelation, and what you want to give us. That in our lives, we look to the talents and abilities that you have given us and that we surrender them back to you. That we use them for your glory. That everything that is around us, we surrender it to you. Our minds, our hearts, our intellect, our writings, everything that you have surrendered in our lives, everything you have put in us, the education that we think we, we got on our own, everything that you have truly led us to do. That we are ready with whatever weapon you have given us to do whatever you instruct at any given moment. I thank you for every person who is on here and I thank you for their hearts. I ask you to minister to them in their lives, any insecurities, any areas where they feel less than, I ask you to remove all shame, every spirit of shame, every sign, symptom, and manifestation of the spirit of shame or the spirit of pride. I ask you to kill Leviathan in our lives, go in and uproot it and kill it right now. Just kill it. And that we actually surrender everything. These talents are not ours. We do not boast about them. We give them all to you. And I ask you to breathe your Ruach over our minds. Breathe your Ruach over our hearts. Breathe your Ruach over our hands and our bodies and our bloodstream down to the cellular level that we are filled and that we're so obedient to you that when you tell us, to do something that would be treacherous or unlawful that we would not fear. I rebuke all fear in the name of Jesus. Perfect love come in and cast out every phobia, every fear right now that you come into our lives and that we will be bold and fearless when the time comes to do what you have asked us. No matter the laws, no matter what, you, what the enemy says, that whatever you tell us, you have our yes. I declare all doubt and unbelief to be removed right now. And we surrender to the yes, to your yes. We surrender to yes. We surrender to obedience. There's no rebellion in us. I rebuke every sign, symptom, and manifestation of the spirit of rebellion in our lives and that we always follow you and that we never doubt in following you. I declare freedom for our lives. I declare obedience for our lives. I declare boldness and that we walk in what we're called to do. If it is to be a mother, that we walk in that boldness. If it's to be an artist, that we come in and we just are bold for you. That if we're called to be a father, that we do that with our hearts and with passion. That whatever it is that you have called us to do, that we do it with our yes to you. A yes that's immediate, not a yes that's delayed by doubt. 
I rebuke all doubt in the name of Jesus, and I declare freedom, and we hold every thought captive to the obedience of Christ right now, and we just declare our yes to you in Jesus' name. Amen. I don't even know what to say, but you guys say whatever you want. Thank you, Corinne.